In this lecture, we're going to take a look at two things. We're going to first look at the decomposition of our strain, stress strain curve into elastic and plastic strains. And then we're going to take a look at something called the Ramberg Osgood equation and the paper that they wrote in the early 40s. So the last time we, we just finished converting our engineering stress strain curve into a true stress strain curve. And from, from this point on, I'm going to be talking about the true stress strain curve unless I make some other mention otherwise. So here we have our uh, sigma epsilon, our initial straight line portion, and then it uh, yields and maybe does something like that. And so perhaps our yield stress is around this location right here. Now below the yield stress, if I were to put a load on my material, a load up to say this level of stress, and release the load, then I would come back down here with zero strain. But once I exceed my yield stress, If I were to let go of the load, for most metals, what would happen is it would unload, but it would unload with a path that's parallel to the initial portion of the stress strain curve. Okay, so for sigma greater than sigma yield, it would get to this position A, and then it would unload to position B. So when I unload, I have zero stress, but I do have some residual strain. And the thinking then is that the amount of strain that is left over is known as our plastic strain. And the amount of strain that went away would be our elastic or our recoverable strain. So that means up at this point on the stress strain curve when I was here, when I was here at sigma and epsilon, I had both elastic and plastic strain components up there. So we're going to assume here that epsilon is equal to an elastic part plus a plastic part, where this is a recoverable or our elastic strain. And this term right here is our permanent or our plastic strain. The assumption that we're going to make about the decomposition of the strains is that the amount of elastic strain is still related by Hooke's law. So in this case, if I'm linear elastic, sigma is equal to E epsilon relates axial stresses and strains. So my strain must have been equal to sigma divided by the modulus of elasticity. And even when I'm up here, the elastic strain is going to be sigma divided by the modulus of elasticity. So if I want, I can state that the strain part right here, which we can call the total strain, is equal to its elastic and its plastic parts. We have a functional relationship between stress and elastic strain that we'll use. Sigma is equal to, uh, excuse me, epsilon is equal to sigma over E. But there's some other functional relationship that describes the plastic strains and how they are related to stress. All right, had a little bit of an interruption there. And so if we can find that functional relationship between plastic strain and stress, then we can express our total strain in these two parts that we have here. Sigma over E, the elastic part, and then this plastic part over here. Now, uh, at this point, I want to introduce a paper by Ramberg and Osgood. It's kind of a uh, famous paper, I guess you'd say, in plasticity. And it's uh, from an old NACA report. Uh, NACA is the was the agency that was before NASA. So let me uh, let me pause. Let me call that up. All right. And I know this is impossible to read. It's uh, a copy of a document that I got at uh, University of Illinois. 
when I was there. But if you zoom in real close on it, you can see that this was a restricted document. Uh, this is classification canceled, and it's dated uh, February 1946. And uh, so this is technical note number 902. You can find this on the web if you search for it. It's a description of stress strain curves by three parameters uh, by Walter Ramberg and William Osgood. It's kind of an interesting paper in that uh, they go through different people who have proposed different stress strain curves for different materials and they did their own test. Now this being uh, the progenitor of NASA they're interested in aircraft and in particular lighter materials, lighter metals, so aluminum materials. And so if we scroll through here we'll see something very similar to the stress strain curves that we had for our 6061 T6. In fact some of these, uh, well this is it's basically 2024 aluminum and they have some different aluminum alloys. They did them in tension and compression. And here's the modulus of elasticity and here's their uh, a tangent line that they have here or a secant line. And uh, so it's kind of an interesting read and the, the, the gist of it is they propose the functional relationship between plastic strain and stress. Now there are others um, lots of different people can have different lot, different uh, uh, formulations for this, but the the gist of it and the way it's written these these days is maybe a little bit different than what they had shown, but it's the basic idea. They proposed a power law fit, so if you have the plastic strain being equal to some coefficient. to some exponent and then that being equal to the stress then that was their proposed functional relationship. If we want to solve this for plastic strain we would take sigma divided by that coefficient and take it to the 1 over n power. If we wanted to show this on a plot where we have log plastic strain and this would be log stress If this was a perfect fit, then we would have a perfectly straight line on the log log plot. The slope of this straight line would be related to n, and the place where we would have extrapolated out to one plastic strain would correspond to this value of k over on this axis. Now k is known as the strength coefficient. and n is the strain hardening exponent. So with this formulation, this functional relationship, we can express our total strain then as our elastic strain plus our plastic strain. total strain being equal to the stress divided by the modulus of elasticity plus sigma over k to the 1 over n power. So as a continuation of that homework assignment, I'm going to ask my students to find k and n for that particular 6061 T6 material. Now if you plot the plastic strains, and the way you're going to have to find is plastic strains is you'll take the plastic strain is equal to the total strain minus the elastic strain. What you'll find is that these data points aren't exactly on a straight line. I mean they're pretty good. You know they might deviate here a little bit. They might get a little closer over here. But the exact value of n and k may be different depending on your interpretation of how to fit this data to this functional form. So this might be something like this and you might get a certain value. If you fit that set of data, if you fit this set of data you might get a different set of constants k and n. Uh, but the idea then is, again what I want my students to do for homework, is if you plot stress versus total strain 
and if this was your experiment, now we're talking about the true stress and strain, that when we do that, I would hope that we would be able to get a very close fit with our values of K and N. So you may have to adjust these a little bit. Now there's nothing uh, magical about this equation. It's purely a curve fit. It uh, doesn't depend on the microstructure and all these kind of good things that uh, we know go on in a material and affect the material properties. But sometimes what you need is something very simple. If you have a lot of uh, experimental data and a lot of detailed micromechanics, sometimes finding all the input that goes into that kind of model can be more difficult than a very simple model that gets you most of the way to where you want to be for your either your plasticity analysis, your finite element analysis with plasticity, or maybe even a fatigue analysis with a little bit of limited plasticity involved. Some kind of strain life fatigue analysis or low cycle fatigue. Now, one of the things I want to point out about this formula, let me, let me make a new page here, is that this is not analytically invertible. What I mean by that is if we're given sigma, it's easy to find the strain. But if we're given epsilon, it is relatively hard it's not analytically invertible to get the stress. And so one of the things that we're going to learn how to do is something called a newton raphson iteration technique. We'll talk about that in the next uh, video, where we're going to find uh, what sigma is if we're given a certain strain and knowing our material properties. All right. Well, while we're here, maybe uh, I'll bring up that Excel spreadsheet, and I will see if I can calculate my ramberg osgood material constants. We already have the modulus of elasticity. So uh, let me uh, switch over to my Excel worksheet and we're going to do a little bit more work with this now. This was my true strain and so what I'm going to have over here is going to be my plastic strain, my true plastic strain. which is my total strain minus my stress um, in pounds per square inch divided by my modulus of elasticity and let's see what that is we have that on the chart 10.18 times 10 to the 6 So that's a pretty small number. Looks like about 43 microstrain down there at the start of it. And uh, we'll just copy this down to the end of this line that we have here. And let's do this. Let's um, copy this plot. I'm going to paste it over here. Let's get rid of the engineering stress strain curve. And let's edit this so that we have AM on our x axis instead of AL.
Now, one of the things about the Ramberg Osgood equation is it is a continuous yielding curve. There is no defined yield point in the Ramberg Osgood equation. For any value of stress, you're going to get a tiny little bit of plastic strain. If you choose the right K and N, that won't really kick on until you get pretty close to uh, where you want it to have an appreciable amount of plastic strain. Okay, so now we're, let's do one more thing. Let's copy this. And let's change these axes to log log axes. And uh, hopefully that'll let us do that without uh, complaining. Okay. I have um, some tiny values. Now you see here where we're primarily in the elastic region, we, we have a lot of weird data. Okay. So this initial portion of the data I'm going to throw out. So really anything above your 0.2% offset yield stress, we're going to throw out. Now, I haven't computed the 0.2% offset yield stress in this video, but I do want you to do that for your homework. So let's start our data at maybe, um, well, let's see, maybe about this value, 155. Be careful when I use the arrow keys when I'm in this panel because it messes it up. Okay, so now on this chart, here's our data, and we've gotten rid of all that kind of weird stuff. So what we can do, we can add a trend line. We can set this to a logarithmic and show our equation. And the fit looks pretty good. Uh, we can see uh, maybe it's fitting a little differently on the extremes but uh, what we're going to do next is I'm going to work with this just a little bit we're going to figure out what our um, what our fit needs to be in order to express this equation so right now I have sigma is equal to some coefficient times the ln of plastic strain and I need to rearrange that in order to get it in the form that I want okay and so I think what I wanted was this power law fit and uh, here I still have R squared of about 0.9. Here's my coefficients. Like I said, we're going to start with these coefficients as a starting point, and we may have to adapt them. An n equal to 0.027 is kind of a small value for n. But uh, let's work with this and let's see what we can get by plotting our fit as compared to our original data. All right, so what I've got right now is I have my my data, and this is my experimental data for true stress and strain. Again, if you do this for me for homework, please put titles on your plots and everything. I'm just trying to do this a little bit fast so we get through this. And now I'm going to start with my stresses. Okay, here's my stresses. And I'm going to use my calculated K and N and see what kind of numbers, uh, see what kind of comparison I come with, up with on my true stress and strain. So here will be my K, and here will be my N. And let's see, according to my fit, it was about 55,700. Now this is in units of PSI, and my exponent was about 0 0.0271. And for this, then, I want to take and uh, get on the right spot here. I'm going to take my stress and I'm going to divide it by my modulus of elasticity. I said it was about 10.18 times 10 to the 6. 
and then I'm going to add to that my sigma over k. It's going to have to be in brackets. Right, I'll put my dollar sign here and here. To the 1 over n, which is here, and I'm going to put my dollar sign. I'm going to take this down, and I forget which number we were at, we got to. Um, I think, uh, let's see. That's too far, but that's okay. We'll calculate it, and then we just won't make the plot with all that data in it. Okay, now I'm going to come in here. Okay, now that's, that's my total. Now this... other column I'm going to make my plastic strain to be a little bit careful here when I do this because I have to change it to AK for my stresses and this one's just going to be the plastic part I'm going to get rid of that part of it These are the calculated values. All right. So on my total strain plot, Add a series that have these y values, my stresses. I'm going to add a series that have the bj strain values. So that'll be my total strain. Choose a different color, maybe the green. Now that only selected that single. You just select the entire series. There we go. And you know, this is a little bit too far. I need to cut that off a little bit, but we'll do that in a moment. And then over here on this diagram, I have my stresses. Now I want this to be the plastic strains, and that's BK. for my x-axis. Oops. Let's cancel that. Need to add a series. should be BK here.
All right, let's truncate this. So this goes up to 409. So that looks okay. Let's change our marker. Our marker fill. And our line. All right, so I'm going to do a little bit of work. I'm going to pause the video. I'm going to uh, make some adjustments to this so that we can uh, get the data to stop at, at the same spot on this curve. All right, and actually, I guess it does stop at the same point. It's just that we're getting a lot more strain from this power law relation. So right now, I would say we don't have a great fit if what we're trying to do is to match this red curve. So while I have this in my spreadsheet, what I'm going to do is come up here, you know, move these plots up so we can see how they change. But we really want to get a, a little bit better fit to what actually happened in the experiment. So I'm just going to play around with these numbers a little bit. If we make this to be a fairly large number, you can see the changing behavior. We can stiffen this up. And so I'm going to make a few adjustments. We're going to see where this drives it. And I'll see if I can do a little bit better than that default uh, fit that we had. And we talked about why that may not give us exactly what we want already. All right, so I spent a few minutes just kind of adjusting some of these numbers. And I'm pretty close. Now, if you notice, I don't have as distinct of a, of a yield point in my fit, which is the green line, as I do in my experimental data. But the strain values pretty well match out on this range, and even the furthest value seems to be pretty good. And so here I am at 63.5. Let's just uh, paste these values just so I don't forget them. Let's do a couple more changes. If I increase this value just a little bit, let's make it 64,000. It tends to bring it back a little bit. So if I go 63,200, then I'll extend it out. There's 63,100. Okay, it's a little bit far yet. 63,5. So maybe 63,4. Gets it pretty close to the same value of, of total strain and, and strain down, plastic strain down here. And uh, this curvy part can be influenced somewhat on the value of n that, that, that I've chosen. And here I've got 0 0.065. Now if I go down and look at my spreadsheet, that's quite a bit different than my initial. But see, this is influenced very heavily by these data points out here. So what I did is I refit it in this region. And here I got close to 0.06. I got 0.05. So I'm probably getting a little bit better fit. Now if I change this a little bit, going to change my, my curve. Let's just change it to 0.066. See what happens. Okay, that tends to extend it a little bit. If I, if I make this a little bit smaller, that probably is going to cause that to break at a little bit higher value. So I can try adjusting this a little bit more. Oops. Let's put, put 06. So I can have some influence on the breaking value by changing this. Okay, so I'm going to just play with this just a little bit more, and I'll see how well I can do. Uh, now these 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 fits from Excel they can only get you so far. Remember, this is a phenomenological fit. It's a curve fit. So if it fits the plastic strains well and the elastic part in your total stress strain curve, then we're doing pretty good. OK, so for a second set, uh, here's another set that looks pretty good. 
Uh, you can see that it's a little underestimating the strains here and it's overestimating the strains here. Kind of depends on where you're at and, and how much um, accuracy you need out of this. Depends on whether you're in stress controlled conditions or strain controlled conditions. But um, I'm going to go with these a 0 0.5, 0.05 in 6750 PSI. So, so that's just an example of being able to find our Rainbow Gauss good material constants from our experimental data of our true stress and strain. All right, so let me go ahead and write that down on this page. We're going to go with n is equal to 0.05. And we're going to go with our K as 60,750. And so this is a fit best overall fit to a stress of about 52 KSI. and a corresponding strain of about six and a half percent which is pretty good um, it's pretty 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 fair amount of strain now if I didn't think I was going to have as much as two or three percent plastic strain and you may not well then what I would do is I would go back and I would fit this data so that it fits in this range of up to two or three percent strain uh, a little easier. All right, so I think that's where we wanted to go with this part of it. In the next lecture, I want to talk about something called Newton Raston iteration and how to program that into Fortran so that we can find out uh, what our stresses are for a given strain level.